up YouTube, Crash Wilcox, new year, new setup. I uh, hope you guys like it, trying to clean up my act and get a little more professional in what I'm doing here. So it's not some fancy new studio, just a little bit nicer workspace. So um, hope you guys like it. If you don't, get your own workspace. And uh, another big shout out to our Patreon fam. Thank you so much for the contributions. It means the world to me. Um, so here we are in our second installment in the PC Building 101 sort of series that I'm trying to do. Um, in installment one, we looked at motherboards. Um, this time we're going to be taking a look at CPUs. Um, just like we did with the motherboard, we're going to be trying to make sort of the, uh, the terms and stuff that you're going to hear associated with the CPUs a little bit easier to, to digest if you've never really dug into this stuff before. Um, so you're not, you know, spending your time trying to figure out what they're talking about. You can actually just dig into the numbers and research and find out what's the best product for you. So that's the whole point of this. Um, so, like I said, we're going to talk, uh, talk about the CPUs. Um, that's the central processing unit. Um, you can think of that as a, sort of the brains of your computer. Um, it's going to take the inputs from the operating system and it's going to take all that information and push it out to the different components in the computer um, to make it act the way it needs to act to um, get those instructions or those inputs um, satisfied. So just like we do walking around in this world, you know, the world gives you a lot of information. Your brain takes all that in and then it tells your body how to react. You know, so if you're walking out of that bar, stumbling out at two in the morning on that dark alleyway and some dude sneaks up behind you, um, your brain's going to tell you to punch that dude in the face and you should listen to him or to your brain because you don't sneak up on people in a dark alleyway at two in the morning. Um, so like we did with the motherboard, um, this is not going to be some deep technical dive into everything that makes a CPU. Um, this isn't the right channel and uh, this isn't the right time to do all that. Um, this is going to be just trying to give you a good foundation so that you can go forth and prosper and, uh, you know, start, start with a, a solid foundation on your, uh, PC building adventures. Um, so with that said, before we jump into um, breaking down the CPU, um, please like this video, um, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and if you find it in your heart, follow the link to the Patreon page. Consider contributing, um, helping me create more videos like this. I would be very, very um, well pleased with that. So Anyways, the things we're going to be talking about today in regards to the CPU is clock speed, um, voltage, your cache memory, TDP, overclocking, um, cores, threads, hyperthreading, and then APUs, CPUs, and CPUs with integrated graphics. Um, and I do have notes here, so if you see me looking down, it's not because I disdain you, it's because I have terrible short-term memory. So I need this to help me. Um, in the description below, I'll also link um, timestamps um, to the different topics. So if you're just too busy in your life to actually watch this whole video, you can just take what you need from me and leave. Like all my girlfriends in high school did. Whew, that got dark, huh? Anywho, let's move on. Okay, so getting started with the CPU. Um, we're going to take a look at what a CPU is, what an APU is, and then what a CPU with integrated graphics is. Um, so for the discussion today, we're going to kind of use the term CPU um, is just the overarching name for a computer processor. Um, and then we'll kind of make distinctions between um, three different types of CPUs. Um, so first you have an APU and that stands for an accelerated processing unit. Um, and that's just the name that AMD sort of gives to their CPUs with integrated graphics. Um, Intel, on the other hand, they just have CPUs with integrated graphics. Um, you might see it listed as like UHD or um, ultra high definition is their graphics. Um, and then lastly, we have CPUs without integrated graphics. Um, so this Ryzen 9 3900X, for example, does not have integrated graphics at all. Um, so this can be, uh, be confusing when it comes to choosing the CPU because um, you need to know if you're getting a CPU with integrated graphics or if that's something you want, you need to know how to decipher. So on the Intel side of the house, 
um, the way that you can decipher, at least in the desk, uh, desktop space, this doesn't have anything to do with mobile and laptops and stuff like that, um, just the desktop CPUs. Um, if it has an F in the name, then that denotes that it does not have integrated graphics. So you will need a dedicated graphics card for an F um, series chip. So for example, if you buy an i3-9100F, it does not come with integrated graphics. Um, whereas if you buy the, what this is, an i3-9100, it does have integrated graphics. No F in the name, integrated graphics. F in the name, no integrated graphics. Um, on the AMD side of the house, um, AMD uses the letter G to classify their um, integrated graphics cards. Um, so this here is a Ryzen 3 2200G. That G denotes that there is integrated graphics in here. Um, you'll also see maybe on the box, whatever, Radeon Vega, um, but the G will denote that there is integrated graphics on that CPU. Um, so whether it's Intel or uh, AMD, um, CPU with integrated graphics is just simply a CPU that has embedded, that basically has an embedded graphics processing unit inside that CPU. Um, so with, the, with an APU or a CPU with integrated graphics, you can use your computer, you can watch videos, you can even play games um, with that um, integrated graphics chip in there. Now it won't be as good, you know, as something with a dedicated graphics card, but for a budget friendly option, um, it's definitely a good way to go. Um, now you can also use an APU or a CPU with integrated graphics along with a dedicated graphics card. Um, you can do both. Um, so maybe you want to start on a really restricted budget, but you want to get something that you can build on later um, when you get some more money for a graphics card or something. These are a good option to go with. Um, so say you start with a Ryzen 3 uh, 2200G and then later on you get some money and you decide to go buy a graphics card. You can plug that in. It'll work just like um, any other CPU would work. Um, that's actually what I did this with this CPU. This is in my kid's computer. We bought the 2200G. They used that. And then we went and found a good deal on a RX 570 and plugged that in. Works like a champ for Fortnite, uh, eSports games, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then the last thing on the topic of CPUs, APUs, and stuff with integrated graphics, um, it does not... Um, if it has integrated graphics in the CPU, it does not mean that it has less performance um, than a CPU without integrated graphics. Um, so basically, an F-series uh, CPU from Intel um, is not less powerful because they crammed a, a graphics processing unit in there than a non-F-series. Um, you can see they have the same um, clock speed, core counts, all that stuff. So they're the same CPUs. They perform the same, they just with or without integrated graphics. So don't feel like if you get one with integrated graphics, it's going to somehow perform um, less than its non-integrated graphic brother. Um, that's not the case. Um, so next up, we'll dive into CPU cores. Um, so when you're talking about a core, it's essentially a CPU's processing pathway. Um, so one core can basically handle one task at a time. And this isn't always the case, um, and we'll get into that when we get into hyper-threading. Um, but you can think of a CPU sort of as a highway, and the cores of that CPU are the lanes of the highway. So the more lanes that a highway has, the more traffic it can handle. Um, so here on the desk, we have two four-core CPUs, um, and we have one 12-core CPU. So Obviously, the 12 core um, can handle, you know, more traffic than the four core in, uh, from Intel or AMD. So um, that's pretty simple what it is, it's just a processing pathway. Um, and then a term that gets closely associated with cores, you'll of, often hear them um, kind of used together, is threads. Um, the thing that's different about a thread is a thread is basically a virtual core. Um, you'll sometimes hear them referred to as logical cores. Um, so you might hear um, something like this Ryzen 9 3900X, it's a 12 core, but it has 24 threads. Um, and that brings us into hyper-threading. So 
Oftentimes when you're talking about cores and threads, hyperthreading is uh, very closely associated with those as well. Um, so hyperthreading, it basically will allow a single processing core um, to handle like two independent sets of instructions at the same time. Um, so it'll basically take one physical core and kind of turn it into two virtual cores. Um, so it can improve your computer's um, performance just by increasing its uh, efficiency. Um, now, it doesn't in fact double your uh, core count, so this doesn't become a 24 core CPU. It is a 12 core CPU. Um, the way I've heard it said that I think helps for me is if you picture somebody sitting at their desk, you know, doing paperwork or whatever it happens to be, and if you're taking just one core, so this is a four core, four thread, it's not hyper-threaded. So um, it can process one piece of information at a time. So that would be like someone doing paperwork and every time they finish a piece of paper, they have to reach behind them and grab another piece of paper and reach behind them and grab another piece. Well, when it hyper-threads, it's essentially like having, um, you know, basically two people standing behind you holding paper out. So as soon as you finish something, you're just grabbing the paper here instead of, you know, reaching to find it. Um, and then because it can handle basically two sets of instructions at the same time, if this guy runs out of paper and has to go find another stack, it just turns and grabs this paper. So it, it just helps funnel that information um, so that it doesn't really ever bottleneck or slow down the CPU because it's waiting on uh, information to be fed to it. It gets basically multiple pathways of information fed into that one core that'll process it. So um, I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, if you have a better way to look at it, let me know in the comments. Um, but uh, last thing to note on that, hyperthreading is uh, kind of generically used to talk about, um, you know, splitting uh, physical cores into logical cores but that's actually an Intel specific term. AMD used the term simultaneous multi-threading or SMT. So if you hear SMT hyper-threading, they're the same thing, just from two different companies. Um, uh, next up, we'll talk about clock speed. Clock speed refers to how many cycles per second the core can execute. So how, quick your, how quickly your CPU can process data. So using that highway example again, if the cores are the lanes on that highway, then clock speed is the speed limit on that highway. And higher clock speeds generally means better performance and you know, common tasks. So that's why things like gaming benefit more from clock speed than they do from cores. So just having a really high core count CPU isn't always beneficial for gaming. Typically getting those clock speeds up a little bit higher will help you out more. So let's say, for example, you had two computers and all the components that you were using were exactly the same. And say you had two CPUs in there. Oh, the i9-9900K. Best gaming CPU on the planet. You guys didn't see that coming. You didn't know that I was putting another CPU box up here. No, you didn't. You didn't know. I surprised you. So just be surprised. So say you had two computers, exactly the same, all the components, even the CPU, two i9-9900K. And the only thing that was different about those computers is one was running at stock speeds for the i9-9900K. 4.7 gigahertz, and the other one was running at five gigahertz. So everything being the same, you should see a difference in performance between those two computers based on the higher clock speeds from the five gigahertz computer. Now it may not be a monumental difference in everything that you do, but it should be a noticeable difference, especially if you're running benchmarks or something like that, you should notice a difference because of those higher speeds. So a term that you'll also hear associated with clock speeds is overclocking. And overclocking simply means pushing your CPU to clock speeds that are higher than they'll ship from the manufacturer. So you'll do this kind of in an effort to boost the performance of your CPU. So take an Intel CPU, for example, 
um, they will come either locked or unlocked. Um, and you can uh, know if a CPU is locked or unlocked, again, based on that naming. So if there's a K in the name of the CPU, then it's an unlocked CPU. If there's no K, it's locked. So that i9-9900K means it's unlocked. Um, so it can be overclocked. This i3-9100, no K, no overclock. It's not unlocked. Um, so like I said, you can only overclock an unlocked Intel CPU. Um, as for Ryzen, on the other hand, or AMD, um, all their CPUs are unlocked and um, for the most part, I'm not sure 100%, but for the most part, all their CPUs are um, unlocked and they're able to be overclocked. Um, it doesn't matter what lettering is in their name. So this 3900X, for example, the X doesn't denote anything special as far as um, overclocking ability. Um, but with Ryzen CPUs, um, they typically don't make for as good of overclockers um, as Intel CPUs. Um, they typically tend to ship from the manufacturer pretty near their peak performance. Um, whereas Intel, on the other hand, they seem to ship with a little extra headroom um, to be able to push them um, in, in overclocking. You know, that's why you see something like an i9 9900K that you know, may run at 4.7 gigahertz. It's pretty standard to see that overclocked um, to five gigahertz without much um, effort. Now there's a lot of other factors and components that come into whether or not you can overclock and how far you can overclock. Um, and again, we're not gonna get into that a ton today, um, but just know the K for Intel is important. Um, AMD, they're all unlocked and overclocking is simply um, pushing your CPU to higher clock speeds to try to boost that performance. Um, so one factor that we'll touch on that kind of has to do with overclocking um, is going to be voltage, um, just because it kind of pertains to um, your CPU nomenclature. So pretty simply, um, CPU voltage is just the amount of power that your CPU uses. Um, so again, it's closely related to that CPU clock speed um, and overclocking because typically the higher that your clock speed is, um, the higher the voltage requirement is going to be. Um, you know, you can mess around with the numbers, but that's generally um, a good way to look at it. So um, another thing that comes along with higher voltage um, tends to be higher temperatures. Um, and that kind of leads us into TDP. Um, the next topic we'll touch on. So TDP, um, that stands for thermal design power. Um, and that's just basically uh, a simple indicator of your CPU's power consumption um, and the heat output. So a CPU's uh, TDP um, will kind of influence the power supply that you use, the CPU cooler that you use. Um, so a higher TDP, a bigger power supply, um, a better CPU cooler, that sort of thing. Um, something to note about TDP, it's not really an exact science. So the numbers that you see on there, I think this has a 105 TDP. Um, it's not an exact science. Gamers Nexus um, did a pretty good um, breakdown of what TDP was. Um, I'll try to link that video in the description below. Um, like I said, there's a lot of ways that they go about deriving the information that they get for those TDPs. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, if you're looking at buying a certain processor and you don't know what power supplies to get or what um, CPU cooler to use, um, it's best to just go online, maybe go to YouTube, um, maybe go to my page, Crash Four Cox Computers. Um, take a look at some of the bills that we've made or other people have made. See what they're using, um, and kind of use that as a good baseline. Or just you know, you can probably research you know Facebook, Reddit, whatever it happens to be for what people are using that seems to work. Um, and then uh, one last thing that I want to touch on here, as far as our CPUs for the PC uh, Building 101, is your cache memory. Um, this isn't something you'll hear a ton about, but um, I think it's important. Um, so cache memory, um, another term you might hear referred to as like your L3 cache or the memory, CPU memory. 
Um, and that just refers to the memory that a CPU can store uh, without having to access any other storage um, device. So CPUs, so this Ryzen 9 3900X, for example, um, has 70 megabytes of um, cache. So it can store important pieces of data um, that it'll need to access often. Um, so this kind of allows for quicker retrieval um, of that information. It doesn't have to go through the RAM, the hard drives, and that sort of stuff to pull that information. So the data is readily available inside the CPU. Um, and the CPU is going to determine what uh, information that it deems um, important enough to store as cache. Um, so the larger amount of cache that you have, obviously the more information and more data that you can store and have readily available. Um, so we covered a lot of stuff here. I know I kind of went through it fast. Like I said, I'm not trying to do a deep dive. I just want to give you um, a basic understanding of some of these terms so you can go and start doing your own research. If there's anything that you wanted to know about that wasn't touched on here or you're still a little bit fuzzy about what some of these terms are, let me know in the comments section. I'll do my best to answer that. Um, again, please like this video. If uh, you found it useful, you found it helpful, enjoyable, please uh, subscribe to the channel. And then, like I said, please consider contributing to the Patreon page. That would do me a world of good. Um, but anyways, thanks for watching. Peace.